This is Alex Bateman. Uh, thank you, James. Thank you for bringing us all together at this sort of wonderful opportunity to see a sort of unseen, which I'm excited to talk more about, but a lot of this work um, hasn't been seen, hasn't been taken out of sort of the box that it was in since 1965 when it was, uh, much of it was shown at the Bianchini Gallery in New York. And um, I think maybe that's a, a good place to, to begin the conversation is to maybe ask, because of course, Billy unfortunately passed away in September of last year, but I, I know that this show was already one that he had in mind um, as the next show. And so, Mary, maybe we could begin. And Mary, of course, is, is Billy's widow and um, has sort of seen this show, you know, through. And uh, maybe we could talk about why um, Billy wanted to see this body of work in particular as the next exhibition. <coughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome. And um, well, it's a slightly bittersweet <coughs> show in that uh, it was planned pre-COVID and, of course, COVID sort of delayed its production and production and production. But I think um, at, the, at the time, well, there was a sort of a few several decades where Billy was not um, interested in these particular works, I think, because uh, he kind of went on to tougher intellectual works, conceptual works, and uh, I think he thought these were a little bit easy. Uh, and really, he uh, we started getting out the serographs, and people started enjoying them. And I think he started to look at them again, and then the stories came out about um, his interests in not the rainbow symbolism so much. Um, it was more about the uh, how light was produced and his, um, his his trajectory to try and find the purest possible color. Split the light, and if you notice in the room um, that the, there are no external light sources, it's all this sort of beautiful light created by the, um, a lot of electricity running through the, the neon. So you were saying that he came to reconsider the value of these works which he had put away sort of since. And do you have a, an, an idea of why he came to reconsider them? Uh, was it more than just the sort of appeal that certain people saw in the Mozart? I think, um, well, Adnan Yildiz, uh, who is a Turkish curator now in Germany, he curated a, a show about um, a homosexual bill, uh, and a, 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 I think 40 years since a, the decriminalization of homosexuality in, in New Zealand, and he got out the neon. And I think just seeing them again, he started to appreciate them again and you know I, I think thanks to Tina's book and Billy's one of those people that always went forward he never looked back um, he reprised a lot of ideas would sort of come through and go through but I think really um, he was getting to an age and stage where he was starting to actually look back and he was starting to focus on his archive um, his archive is, I always say, it's F for floor, P for pile, and B for boxes. Um, there's no filing system. But he was starting to think about enjoying going through things he'd done through his life. So I think really there's that, that side. And then I think the, the other factor is that as a 16-year-old, his first job was in a paint factory, and they examined, they, they made paint, paint colours by colour matching with eye, and that drove him nuts. So he developed a proportional system and painted out cards. And so he's always kind of um, looked at how things are put together, and, um, and uh, these kind of follow into that 
sort of mentality, that way of thinking, I guess. Well, I think that's a really interesting point because something that seems, as you said, is a through line through his work from early on is this idea of collaboration and also working with experts in different, often sort of new technologies. And it's a nice sort of moment to point to um, the book, which, um, you know, and so I think, because we are very lucky to have uh, both Mary and also uh, Christina Barden, who's the author of this sort of definitive monograph um, on, on Billy, and uh, which sort of weaves both a sort of biography, but also a sort of art history and Billy's <laughs> sort of run through so many of the veins of, of art history. And I think we're seeing again, one of those veins being sort of light art, which of course, at this moment of the, of the mid sixties was uh, something being explored by a number of different artists. Um, but I wonder, Tina, if you could talk a bit about um, the sort of position of this work within um, his career, because as we were talking about earlier, I think it's a really interesting show to have in, in London, because of course uh, the show, you know, the original show was in, was in New York, as we said, but um, the original uh, idea, as you discuss in, in the book and in the catalog for this exhibition, sort of happened in, uh, in London. So in a way, this body of work sort of bridges quite nicely those, those two episodes. So maybe you could talk a bit about that sort of moment in his career, maybe where these works came from in your sort of research uh, uh, into them and, and um, yeah, what maybe role they play. Well, there's lots of different ways to address that question. I do think that there's a prehistory to this body of work, which goes all the way back to his early training in advertising and graphic design in New Zealand. And when you think about um, neon as uh, a form of sign writing that the commercial realm used as an enticement to people to come buy things, and that was uh, illuminating the city and uh, generating a degree of um, uh, excitement and it was out there in the world and Billy's very earliest work was actually as um, uh, working for in an advertising agency and, and making signage for companies including large-scale department stores like Farmers which was the largest department store in Auckland, New Zealand. So he was on one hand thoroughly familiar with the, the landscape of the city and what it looked like. And uh, once he got to London and studied at the Royal College and um, really immersed himself in the, you know, the, the environment of contemporary art, um, he wanted to bring that uh, real world into his work, as was the case for you know, the, the generation of artists around him. So, you know, Neon was first touched on in when he was designing a sign for a restaurant in Auckland. Um, uh, and then at the Royal College, he incorporated elements of Neon into some of his very early works um, because he had access to all of the different departments of the college and could draw on different kinds of expertise to um, experiment, to create um, new formats um, and draw on other people's experience. Uh, so I think he was really relishing that opportunity to, to bring the reality of urban commercial life into his practice and Leon was a natural place to go. And of course once he got to New York, um, he had a, a range of, uh, a far bigger range of expertise to draw on. And these works, I think, are the products of his intense interest in the technology and his access to the sign writers and sign makers uh, and Leon um, fabricators in the city. So, you know, it brings together his inclination to explore new technologies with his fascination for 
incorporating um, urban existence into his practice. One, maybe another topic to discuss would be the motif of, of the rainbow, and you touched a bit on the sort of, obviously it's a sort of loaded icon, and I think it, in a certain way it also is an icon of the 60s of a sort of, you know, flower power era, and um, and something that, that interests me is, is that sort of, you know, duality in, in the work between, on the one hand, a sort of, you know, he's not afraid to embrace a certain uh, motif which, which has a lot of connotations and some of them maybe verge on, on the kitsch or the subjective, but at the same time there's a sort of that interest in technology, uh, the technology of neon and of course in a way the rainbow is also a sort of, you know, structure of light itself and so it's on the one hand this sort of kitsch emblem of, of things and, and a sort of marketing tool in some cases. And on the other hand, it's a sort of very scientifically oriented um, sort of structural analysis of the sort of very terms of, of light uh, itself. And um, I don't know if either of you could, would like to speak more about um, maybe Billy's sort of interest in the motif of the rainbow and those different sort of strands of meaning. I think I think his rainbow, it, it, his interest is about light. Mm -hmm. um, um, it predates the contemporary symbolism. Uh, but I was just sitting here looking and, and thinking as you were speaking. Um, he sort of thoroughly researched the rain, where you get rainbows. So you've got um, waterfalls when you get the mist um, developing a rainbow, and there was a rainbow that doesn't exist now, which is a waterfall with neon coming out. It doesn't exist thanks to the Walker Arts Centre. Um, and if you're from space or a pilot in an aeroplane, you'll see the full circular rainbow in the clouds. You need to be above. And, and then obviously the, the ones that we see from the ground. So he did, you know, he, he didn't just decide to make a rainbow. He sort of thoroughly investigated it, um, what the possibilities of it. That, um, and then you get the double rainbow where you get the, um, the light enters a, a raindrop and then it refracts and reflects and then if it, um, if the ray of light um, hits the other side and goes the other way, you get a double rainbow, and the rainbow colours are reversed. So it, 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 everything you ever want to know is sort of contained here. Um, but I think that dematerialization of the object, and you see the bases here, and then the, the ring kind of lifts off completely, and then this, this one, uh, the big one, the double, doesn't have any sort of bases. And they were all designed to be placed on the floor in the gallery as an immersive um, um, kind of experience, which, you know, when you're up against um, abstract painting and the big American, that world, you know, it was, he really was trying to go forward in, th in his thinking. Mm -hmm. like, uh, Tina's probably better to comment on this. Well, you <laughs> wrote uh, about this work that it has a sort of painterly side, and I wonder if that to you relates to what Mary said about the immersiveness of abstract expressionism, or I don't know, maybe you have another reading, but I don't know, is there a sort of painting conversation as well? I wonder, I don't know. Um, I think that uh, when he got to the States, um, he went into a, a very intense period of experimentation. And within the space of literally a couple of years, he had worked his way through a variety of different technologies, all of which were taking him further away from a hands-on manual approach to making. So just prior to this exhibition, 
he had the opportunity to work with the Xerox Corporation uh, to experiment with their new technology, which is a sort of pre-photocopier process of of, um, no, not the photocopy hadn't been invented hadn't then. Been, but it was, it, a, it was a xerography, which is dry print. Yeah. Uh, dry pigment. Um, the photocopy is the barrel roller. Yeah. So this is so this is different. it's completely different. But it's on in the in the development of that technology to be able to reproduce. And what he was reproducing, and he made an exhibition prior to this, were. Um, paintings, previous images, taken everything from Rembrandt reproductions um, through to advertisements from magazines. So he was finding a way to produce images and printing them and stretching them onto canvas. So they were paintings, but they were, not, but they were paintings by a machine. And um, here, I think he's working with colour which I guess is another mm -hmm. element uh, or that you could um, consider to be um, a principal ingredient of um, painting, but treating it um, as uh, a three-dimensional um, form that you know, emanates light and fills a space, so taking wow. him a further step away from the painted surface. Mm -hmm. um, although these prints, of course, um, take you back to picture making, don't they? And these are actually surprisingly thin mm -hmm. in terms of, um, uh, they're strangely not sculptural. I don't, I don't quite know if I'm finding the right words for them, but they're, it's, it's, they're like drawings. In space, right. rather than um, either objects or painted surfaces. Well, I think this connects uh, Billy's work to a larger context of light art in, in this moment because, um, as Hal Foster sort of discussed about Dan Flavin's work, for him there's a sort of painterly orientation to that kind of um, work because when you deal with light, you can't contain it in the way that theoretically sort of sculpture, the sort of object, like the object is both present, and I think this is very nicely articulated in these works where you have, you know, clearly a sort of object and yet the light exceeds the object and in some degree dematerializes it. And so there's that sort of oscillation that is never fully resolved between the sort of machinery and the sort of object that produces the light and then the light itself which you know sort of exceeds it and also even within the eye and it's amazing you know as you spend time in here the sort of way the color can kind of change you know the, the way that if you put your phone up for example to take an image you immediately are now dealing with the interface of one technology and another and so there's so many layers to the sort of functioning of of color and how technology in this case, the neon technology sort of interfaces that experience, which I think, you know, sort of links again, Billy, to, to other artists of the period um, who were drawn to this sort of new technology um, because it was another way, again, to deal with questions, let's say, of color um, and in, in new ways. And I do think what you're talking about with these sort of plastic works is is true, there's a sort of flatness to them, even though they're also dimensional and they sort of, you know, ask to be seen sort of in a certain frontal way, um, more than anything, the way that they sort of have one sort of plane that continues, even if it sort of undulates. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I also think it's interesting, the choice of neon, and maybe you could talk a bit about I think it's, it's important that it's neon and not, you know, obviously he experimented with certain other forms of, of light in, in his work both prior and subsequently, but neon is a sort of very particular medium and maybe you can talk a bit about why neon appealed to the degree that I think he even worked with neon manufacturers developing colors and so on. Um, two words, pure color. Uh, that's what he was looking for 
and he was on. He went on a, a had a Ford Foundation scholarship and went to Idaho because um, uh, he couldn't understand why French fries were called French fries in America. He thought they should have been called Idaho fries. And there's a very beautiful neon uh, that he made going French fries. Idaho fries, 25 cents. Idaho fries, 25 cents. <laughs> um, he, uh, he met, on that trip, he met the head physicist from the Atomic Energy Commission who uh, he spent quite a lot of time with and went out to the Atomic Energy Commission. And I think... Um, he learned quite a lot about science at that point and all the possibilities of science, went back to New York and made himself known to all the um, neon manufacturers and really started to experiment. I mean, these are kind of passive in that the colours are the right colours to make white light, but the next, the next wave are... Um, he's, he's got... Um, the in the 12 mil diameter tubing, he's put um, glass down the middle, so he's got gas on one side and gas on the other. He's fiddling with the currents. He's uh, doing um, using different powders and these coatings on the glass, all the ways of changing the colors. And uh, he, he also, a bit like this, this big one here, he's got no structures, there's no backing boards or um, things to hold things together. The glass itself is made in such a way that they they're, um, they become self-sustaining. And he ended up, um, we found out, um, he developed over 200 colours and um, two of them went into production. Um, one was a brilliant purple, the other one I love, it's called Apple Green and it's still in production today. So, uh, and I think that um, we've got works from the, from the next wave, which are UFOs, unidentified fluorescent objects um, to bring <laughs> here <laughs> at some point. Uh, and he went on to laser, working with um, the the physicist who developed white light laser and uh, they shot the laser beam out the window to the moon and they needed a scale drawing for that. Uh, and, you know, he just, and then holographs. And then uh, before I keep going, I'm going to turn it over to Tina because uh, <laughs> she um, would talk about the shift from Right. The object to the piles of glass. <laughs> um, I think the neon, you know, for him, neon um, was part of his um, <coughs> physical environment and it was this everyday thing. And I think he was part of a wave of artists who were wanting to bring that everyday reality into uh, the arena of art. Um, so I think that it, that was a, a basic motivation early on, but I think Mary's absolutely right that his real intense curiosity with the technology and his um, uh, clear understanding of the potential of this particular medium to deliver uh, colour through um, uh, you know chemical means. Um, so intrigued him that it led him down this particular route to explore um, to explore its potential and to take it as far as he could. Um, but I think that he got to a certain end point after the next show after this one, where he was he he didn't want to uh, be trapped into making sort of self-contained objects. He, would, he found himself um, uh, not wanting to go in that direction. And I think he pulled back a little bit 
And I think he sort of reassessed the situation. And I think that what he ended up being uh, willing to, um, to embrace in his practice was actually the apparatus that delivers this light, which is not just the tubes, but actually the wires and the equipment and the sound and the, the immaterial qualities, um, the pulsing light delivered by a gas, um, the electric charge, and suddenly he began to, to, to find a great deal of excitement, I think, in the immaterial qualities combined with the technical apparatus. And that led him down a completely different route, which moves him into a phase of um, installation practice, which is much more dispersed and dematerialized than, than this particular phase. And this all happened incredibly quickly, mm -hmm. between 65 and 70. You know, in five years, he moved from making these technically um, sophisticated objects into scattering neon tubes in a space uh, and ending up crushing them and breaking them um, or filming the gases in the tubes and just showing the film without any of the physical equipment. And that led him into um, essentially a, a, a properly, fully dematerialized practice that he played out in the sort of loft studio that he was working in in New York. So for me, um, this is... Um, this is the vehicle for his, his subsequent trajectory. Um, and it's a fascinating way to arrive at a thoroughly um, uh, dematerialized conceptual practice through a material um, considerations um, that embraces technology. It's another way of getting to um, uh, a kind of conceptual practice which I think is really interesting. When you've tra traced a sort of unusual, uh, his sort of unusual route, which is in a way through a sort of pop consideration, like we know the sort of minimal mm -hmm. line that might take certain artists, you know, to that uh, idea, but the, the notion of sort of engaging with the terms of the world through the sort of environment, but that environment being in this case the sort of uh, in some way, the environment of, of sort of advertising and sort of the marketplace, but that that also could then eventually draw attention to that sort of apparatus, the sort of support system, as you put it, um, and then lead him to a sort of conceptual installation practice, but not through, again, the sort of object considerations of sort of other artists in the period. It's very it's a sort of very interesting uh, route. Just to pick up on the sort of advertising, um, it was more, um, he was interested in branding, but it was, at that point, it was um, communication of ideas. All his works were idea-driven in some shape or form. And what advertising, or he was in art directing as opposed to illustration or whatever, it was the art directing where you assembled a team of people who were the expertise in different areas and um, put your campaign together, put your ideas together. And if you remember in New York 1970s, advertising was called the golden age of ad advertising where you know, there was the one-liner, the text image, um, the, the communication theory, etc. And none of that was happening in art at that time. And that's what he recognized and knew that he could um, present in an art um, art setting, but he was too sharp for the advertising world. Um, he got himself into trouble with. <laughs> uh, oh, I just won a prize here for the um, the the first DD and AD design and art directors. Um, the first year they had had presented awards and he'd done a Union Jack, um, like a colouring in book, which was fly posted around the subway. And 
there was a hint of colouring in, and so he um, he said people would stand waiting for the bus or the tube and finish colouring in the Union Jack, and that won the best poster that year. He went up to the top advertising agency and and said, uh, I, "Do you want to give me a job?" And this guy said, um, oh, we've got no vacancies. And he, he said, well, why don't you fire someone? I fire someone, I've just won this prize. And he, this guy just turned on his heel and he said after that, he was never going to get a job advertising <laughs> in London. Well, I think an, another uh, maybe angle of it, which I think you touched on in the sort of the legacy or the next steps of the work, but is maybe the fragility of it, sort of another way in which he, in a very practical sense, I think, encountered the materiality of the object. And sort of, is, it was through the sort of issues around things being broken and, and not being installed correctly, and that led to a sort of very important, I think, piece in his sort of development of it when he sort of reinstalls the materials. Maybe you could talk a bit about um, I guess the sort of fate of many of these works, which I think also then dovetails nicely with, we could then talk a bit about what the experience was like to to dig these works out and, and, and sort of bring them back to life. I think um, one of the purposes of this show was to um, uh, re reprise, reprise the 1965 show. So everything in this show was in that exhibition. And what's missing are the works that were irreparably uh, damaged. Um, not at the Bianchini show, but actually in subsequent outings when it, they were shown in other places. So yes, it was a fragile medium. And it's been a fascinating exercise to bring as much as we can together and, and to do it as accurately as we possibly can. Um, and I think that notion of fragility is, is an interesting one because I can't resist as an art historian to want to try and uh, link um, Billy's work to the times. You know, there's always that idea that the times inform the artist, but the artist also informs the times. And I think that tracking the, his use of neon from 65 mm -hmm. through to about, you know, 72, what we're witnessing is sort of the end of the 60s and moving into the 70s and we're seeing the optimism and sense of endless possibility of the 60s that was incorporated in the fascination for uh, consumer goods and the, the golden age of advertising too. And in a way the rainbow is a sort and of perfect rainbow, symbol perfect of that. Uh, but in utopian. fact it's, 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 it's a utopian idea but actually you know, what is it? It's totally immaterial. And it disappears. The pot of gold, of course, you never reach. And by the 70s, what's happening in, in New York? It's on the verge of bankruptcy. And, you know, it's not a, a, a necessary, um, a particularly flourishing place. People are leaving the city, businesses are leaving the city, um, you know. And, of course, that creates opportunities for artists who move into those abandoned parts of town, or those underdeveloped parts of town and this kind of um, termite activity, um, as one person described it, of artists beginning to work in, in new granular ways with the detritus of the city um, becomes, you know, the ground from which an experimental practice takes off, you know, the early, the early days of Soho. And I think he, his work tracks that. Um, from the optimism of the 60s and the, 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 the promise of the rainbow to its um, evaporation. Uh, and literally at the end, he's grinding the glass tubes into dust and scattering them on the ground and, and, and returning them um, uh, out, in the, you know, out in the landscape. Um, alongside doing other things like sweeping the dirt on his, the roof outside his, his loft or on the streets or picking up broken glass around the city. So I think these, these, the, what we're seeing here is a moment in a trajectory that 
can be beautifully mapped um, alongside the, the evolution of um, you know New York at that particular through that particular period. I think that's a really nice uh, sort of place to maybe end our conversation on and open up to to the audience. And then before that, I just want to say that we do have copies of Tina's wonderful book that are, which I encourage you to take a look at. And if you would like to purchase it, it is available for sale. Um, but yes, with that, I think we'd love to hear if there's any thoughts or uh, questions. In I should add that mm -hmm. the Mayor Gallery has done a wonderful job too in producing a little also special a book just for this show um, uh, with, a, with an essay and a full catalogue of um, the entire Bianchini exhibition. And I know that that's available here too, and I don't know whether you're giving them to people or selling them, but it's, that's also here. Lots of Billy Apple literature. <laughs> When's the movie? <laughs> When's the movie? I saw I, 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 um, I saw the show. I saw the, the nineteen sixty nine show downstairs about ten years ago, or fifteen years ago. And I looked, I looked around the room, and I saw that's an ending. There's a house. There's a um, there's a Lucas, and there's a Turk, like Turk might have killed himself and then renamed himself. And I think Hurst has a, a cucumber and Vaseline together, and it was a pea and a cigarette. And he, all this language, I was going, was, there a, was he a tutor at Goldsmiths? How <laughs> did he As if he doesn't exist, and I was mentioning that, so when we, and the Apple, Apple were next door. No, Apple's over the other, in the other street on Savile Row. So the Apple Records came out after Billy changed his name, and then the computer company has a rainbow through its through the, the Apple logo. Still a bit. The NHS, the, the, the COVID thing, the NHS, the thing, the gay thing. And also in the film Eyes Wide Shut, there's a bit which is a bit like Mr. Ben, where Tom Cruise, the doctor, goes into a dressing up um, fancy dress store, and I think it's called Over the Rainbow, and it's a neon. So Kubrick would have known this, and Kubrick knew loads of people. Are, he was in, um, so just going up, scratching my head, going, Who, where, where's this? He's a missing link in, the, in advertising and everything. And I still don't get to, I was so keen to come and see this show again. again and you go, like, I remember you. Yeah, I, I, you so came yeah. into the gallery and you looked around and looked at everything, and then you went out and then you came back in, and I, I said, Oh, can I help you? And you said, to, You said, I thought, who's this guy that just copied all my friends? And then he looked at the dates and said, no, they've copied him. It said 1969 in the window. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what's going on? So, and then what else? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And so I coined a phrase. So you can make a sign and it says, YBA, yield Billy's apples. Because <laughs> they've gone and straight to come into his orchard and stole all his apples. And they've taken, and there was this lady called Emily who's, I bought a drink for the other day. And I said, Oh, do you like the show? And she was talking to the chap from the Wilkinson Gallery. She said, Oh, I've seen it all before. And I said, Yes, you have seen it all before because this was made in 1965. So there we go. Yeah. Well, I like what you were saying to me earlier about his relationship to Warhol, and I think this seems to sum up. A lot of Billy's approach, he never seemed, in my understanding, like to have a chip, up, too much of a chip on his shoulder about all the sort of, you know, ways in which these ideas have, have circulated. I don't know if you want to touch his, on that idea of... His favorite phrase, he never made up to sell, you know, that wasn't his impetus. And I think art saved him um, because you know, he had this pressure of ideas. He had to produce, he had to work. Um, and he was never going to be able to work in normal jobs because he would drive everybody mad. <laughs> uh, 
So I think art gave him the release that he, he needed um, in order to, you know, um, be himself. Anyway, um, he always said, he always said uh, about everything, he said, I'm like um, the mutual Avis, I'm number two, I have to try harder. And I think there's something in that because uh, the people who had it easy, who were recognised, um, made the money, um, had the big exhibitions and things, um, they didn't have to try as hard. And I really believe that when I know what's sitting in his warehouse, the quality of the work that's sitting there, um, it's a treasure chest. And I think because he always felt he was always trying, always working, right to the end. What I encourage, flipping through the book is in a way to see that idea of a minute sort of element, which like is one nice thing about um, Tina, you being able to sort of produce, I mean, I know this was sort of like in a way your life's work, uh, you know, but all that research and to sort of see all those ideas which came out. And, and again, I think what's also different is that we were talking at lunch about how some artists, you know, had certain ideas early on and then they realized very quickly that they had to sort of latch on to them and spend the rest of their career sort of selling them and, and asserting their priority around those ideas. Whereas, as you were sort of nicely saying, I think mean, Billy just couldn't keep these ideas inside and the last thing he would have wanted is to sort of isolate and, and hawk the same three things forever. He was always wanting to do the next thing. So in a way, maybe he wasn't precious about the individual idea, he would rather have sort of done it once and yeah. let it in the world, and then if other people were to do something with it, it's sort of maybe uh, part of the point. He knew, uh, he knew when people, he, he had an amazing memory and recall of dates, phone numbers, events, who'd done what. He was very professional in his practice, he went out to every show, um, he, you know, he, he also supported the, the young artists. Um, <laughs> As they came out of art school, there was this gap between their in their practice between getting gallery status and, and graduation, and he slotted in at that point, working with people, helping them with, you know, how to light a show, installation practice, and and those sorts of things. So he was out there the whole time, uh, and had a very professional level practice. But yeah. I think some, sometimes he felt a bit hurt when people knew he was around and he, he liked everything to be correct. So the record of history is a record of history, not who's left to fill in the spaces or who takes up the spaces. And some of the um, art historians and things who didn't record history well or didn't do the research well, he wasn't well impressed with. Mm. Dan, yes. Yeah, yeah um, it's well, an observation really. Well, well, two things. One is thinking back to what you were saying about Goldsmiths in the, in the 90s, Billy Apple Serpent talked about the most of the And there was an art scribe magazine about that time, oh, yes. which was uh, very influential in that certain I was introduced to the work. But going back to these pieces and what we were talking about light, you said that they were, you know, that they were about light and, and nature. Um, in a sense, and the, the rainbow. It made me think in a different way. There was a very nice conversation between them and the early Bridget Riley paintings and um, the sort of uh, the optics of the sort of some real responsive eye, which probably is about similar to eight. And I was thinking that. That show would have been 65. Yeah. So it's um, the same moment. Yeah. Same moment. And then I was thinking that actually with those Riley paintings, they were made using. Graphic tools from advertising, the pens. And she um, also had the background. And, and, and exactly, so there's a not, and I wonder if they knew each other, but there was a dialogue. Well, you were saying to me, so Billy's first show was at um, yeah. Gallery yeah. One, and so was Bridget Riley's, and I think Bridget Riley's was, they were right followed, at the same time. Followed on from the so they were side. actually back to back debuting right. their work here in London at the same gallery, so it's in a way. Yeah. Which I think is also the Billy story, like you, you don't necessarily encounter his name a lot, but when you read into something like this, you see, oh, he was right there next to everyone. 
I don't know if there was a conversation between them, but I think that there was there was there's clearly sympathy. Yeah. Um, there's sympathy, but there's also sort of an um, antagonism between yeah. them because yeah. the, the the rainbow motif, which uh, you know, which is urban as a counterculture mm -hmm. sort of feel, would be is, is in a sense the antithesis yeah. of what Riley was yeah. um, interested in. And, you know, we all know that story, but it's interesting to see. How the road is an antithesis, there is this sort of, it feels like for me, if anyone is my first relationship. Really well, I do think actually that's an interesting in what you were saying about the counterculture. And it would be interesting to trace the history of the rainbow within, let's say, hippie iconography. And I wonder if, you know, again, this is sort of speculation, but there's a way in which I almost, one could read these as sort of taking let's say, the rainbow out of the sort of hippie context and putting them in a more clean sort of, you know, almost advertising kind of context. Like, mm -hmm. maybe he's almost anticipating the trajectory of something like counterculture into mainstream sort of kitsch, mm -hmm. you know. Maybe that's one layer of if it. anything, he wasn't was a hippie. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, I feel like he would have had the cynicism to say, all this optimism about, you know, the rainbow and everything and flower power, this is just, you know, on the road to be co-opted and, and, you know, and so on. And so, I, yeah, it's the sort of thing I hadn't thought about until you mentioned yeah, counterculture. Yeah, and I'm thinking about this, you know, we associate the rainbow with the hippie culture, but actually is a sort of a more rainbow, you know, um, the yeah. further back to, you know. Right. Um, I don't it would be very interesting as in another line of, inquiry into the work. I'm, I'm wearing a, um, a Lin Lai rainbow. Oh. <laughs> Another if you remember that in the 1930s uh, um, movie for the you know, ads for the British Post Office. <laughs> I don't know, my, my father was about the same age as Billy, a little bit older, but his favourite film um, was you sang the song? Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and you know, I think the Wizard of Oz had a profound effect on the generation. Um, <laughs> so the Wizard of New Zealand. <laughs> there is a Wizard of New Zealand. Yes. Um, I was just wondering. Um, this is more about writing history mm. or writing different narratives. As he said, he was sort of there with everyone, and yet not that many people would know. So I, I wanted to ask what is the origin of this relationship with this gallery, and how did that come about? That's Mary's story. Or James, even. James. Would you like to talk about uh, your encounters with Billy? Thank you. Billy would come in uh, over the years when he was in England, and then um, I can't remember, I think it was 2009 or so, he just had a, he was having a show in Rotterdam, the Beat the Beat, um, the gallery, and he, it was, it was closing too soon, I couldn't go and see it, but the catalogue was um, there, very complete, and he said, look, all the work is here, so, um, he looked around and said, we'll do London, New York, 1960 to 69, or 69 or And that was where it started, basically started. <clears throat> do you remember when you first saw Billy Apple's work, presumably before that, or was that no, the first before? Um, I get you all confused with dates. Mm. I, 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 I wasn't... I was living in New York when he had the show at the certain time in 72. So I didn't see that. But I, I think I'd seen bits and pieces of his work along the, along the line. But definitely, you know, when you shape the catalogue of the DPV, um, it was, you know, one really did realise that this was a, a treasure trove. So that's where we started working with it. So it's very late in, in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the thing, the, the problem was that 
Philly left New York at exactly the wrong time <laughs> when um, conceptual art was about as popular as a bit of And so um, he went to New Zealand. Then conceptual art started coming back, and the, conce the conceptual artists in New York or in, in America wanted all the glory for themselves, and they were going to keep anybody down to take sort of mile swimming, I think. So they were the only ones that were allowed to be seen. And so I, I think he really suffered from that. And, and, and I think we resurrected, I think, um, I can't remember who the curator was in Rotterdam, really was a major reawakening in Europe. It was um, um, Nicholas Schockhausen, yeah. and he had uh, he'd been talking to Lawrence Weiner, and yeah. he said, "Who do you, Nick, Nicholas asked Lawrence, who do you think I should go and have a look at?" And he he said, "Why don't you go and see what Billy Apple's up to?" Mm -hmm. So that's how the bit of the bit show yeah. came about. I could also add that one of my motives in writing the book um, mm. as an art historian based in New Zealand and well aware of the dynamics of how art history gets written uh, and interested to see how he was excluded from British art history and equally excluded from American art history and actually had his own tussles with New Zealand art history that um, he became a sort of test case for uh, exploring how our history works as um, a discipline of exclusion uh, and uh, and I felt compelled because I think I do believe in his work to try and reinsert him into history but in a way that was true to his practice so that it wasn't just simply claiming him as a lost great pop artist or a lost great conceptual artist, but actually to track his slightly eccentric path through the history um, from New Zealand to England to um, New York, back to New Zealand. And then, you know, I do think that the that, that, that show was a, was a hugely important moment for yeah. him. And yeah. we're still waiting to get a show in England or back in New yeah. York. I know. think one of the problems was that his time in England was quite short, mm -hmm. and as you know, this was first conceived for Robert Fraser's a show, and mm -hmm. Robert was frightened off by it, so mm -hmm. Billy went off to New York. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the problems that Billy suffered was Americans don't like people leaving their country, <laughs> and so um, I think he was, you know, he was being punished because he had become an American citizen. Mm -hmm. But so his years from 64, nearly 30 years in America, mm -hmm. and then to leave, as a name that probably suffered from that mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, but I think that might have had an effect too. Well, I think this has been a wonderful conversation, and much to pick up on you know, and, and also I encourage everyone to look at the book up here. And um, thank you all for coming. <laughs>